morning to you. Good morning, Deidre. How are you? I'm doing great. I hope you are. Yes, absolutely. Well, you know, we have a very comprehensive issue to discuss today. It is your story. It is your life. And I want to get the full effect of that and do it justice. And I want to get that out here for people to really hear this step-by-step -step approach about a serious situation, a challenging mental and physical situation you and your family had to endure. And you had to get an abortion uh, of a child you were carrying and due to a medical situation. And so you've all, you've written this in a book and your book is called? Face Everything and Rise. Face Everything and Rise. Okay, so let's go ahead and get into the book and the situation that prompted the book. So before you had to have an abortion, Kelsey, um, were you pro-life or pro-choice? Before I had an abortion, I was pro-choice. I, what, you know, ever since I was a teenager, I was very much so a speaker of my body, my choice, but it wasn't until I had an experience with abortion that I understood what that choice really meant. Exactly, exactly. And also before this experience, who did you think got an abortion? Did you have that as far as a certain culture or race or lifestyle? And, and did you have a determined on why they got a, an abortion? Before I had my own abortion, um, you know, I didn't, I just thought of it as a, a woman getting an abortion. Like I didn't necessarily think of, you know, like there's a common thought out there that it's party girls going out and, you know, sleeping around and getting pregnant and needing an abortion. And to my knowledge, to what I believed in was just that it was something that people needed in their case, whether it was medical or rape or incest. Um, you know, and that's just what I believed in at the time. So Kelsey, what was your medical situation of why you had to get an abortion? Absolutely. So at 17 weeks pregnant, we went in for our regular anatomy scan where you find out a boy or a girl, okay. um, you know, and they just check on how they're growing and things like that. Mm -hmm. And it was alarming because the radio, the ultrasound technician got very quiet. Okay. And we found out um, through another ultrasound that we got at a maternal fetal specialist that our uh, the daughter that we were, I was carrying had mm -hmm. osteogenesis imperfecta type 2, which okay. is the lethal version of brittle bone disease. So all of the bones in her body were broken at 90 degree angles. Her ribs were breaking in on her heart and her lungs her skull flexed, which it's a bone. It's not supposed mm -hmm. to flex. Right. And so that was the condition that she had. And we also found out that her condition was threatening my life as well, because if one of those bones would have broken and perforated my insides, I could have bled to death. Right. 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 So, so it was with that decision that we just, we, made the choice to have an abortion at 18 weeks. And this is some, okay, of course the doctor told you the diagnosis. And so that's an, uh, that's the option that they gave you. That was the only option that they gave you. Really? That was the only choice or you could have, you could have delivered the baby possibly, but at great risk to yourself. Yes. So the, the two options were have an abortion or wait to see if I could make it to term with the baby with the risk that there was for my life. And also, you know, the fact that she was suffering from these broken bones. Um, and those were the two options. And my husband asked the doctor flat out, well, what do you recommend? And she recommended the abortion. 
um, just to make sure that my life was spared. Right. So let me let me try to I'm not a doctor. I'm not a medical person at all, but I'm going to try to frame this out. So I'm kind of thinking out loud, not only for myself, but thinking out loud for those who may hear this story. So you're at how many weeks? 20 weeks, maybe 17 weeks. So uh, 17 weeks. You're at 17 weeks at the very important appointment where you go to see if you're having a boy or girl, twins or triplets or whatever, that appointment. Yep. And so if you would have chosen not to have an abortion and you would have carried this baby to possible term, I, I think a child in this condition would not have ever made it to term. You, I think you would have probably had the, had the baby early anyway. It, yeah. So, and let's just, just, just pretend to take a, this other option. The baby would have been growing. I don't think the baby would have really been growing inside of you in this condition. And to continue along the way. Meanwhile, the baby is getting weaker and more fragile. Each and every day you're getting is is like stepping on a landmine kind of sorta. So mm-hmm. health health wise for you is is very dangerous. Um then your mindset, your mental, okay, I'm carrying a baby possibly to term that's not going to make it. That's not going to have a high quality of life. And my life is also at danger. And therefore, I have a husband over here and another child. You have another child at this time, correct? Yes, I had a three-year-old son. A three-year-old, a three-year-old son at the time. So you're also jeopardizing their future because if you were to carry the baby and then possibly even uh, died as a result, then they're left without a wife and a mother. Yes. So I'm just trying to give both sides, even though you asked the doctor flat out, they said the the best result would be to have an abortion for this case. I'm just trying to give that other side for people to see that kind of, that's kind of how that would play out. There really wouldn't have been any kind of quality of life or of any happiness or healthiness coming out of that particular choice. Correct. And in Hope's case, we named our daughter Hope. Um, In her case, with that condition, in the less severe cases, the babies only make it to 30 days of life if they make it. And it's they slowly suffocate because their lungs don't develop because of the breaking of the ribs. So she she would have just suffocated to death if she was born full term and that's if she would have made it um and that's not a quality of life for for anyone to just slowly suffocate to death well that's cruelty to humanity really yes. actually for a person to be so um I don't know. I don't want to term that, but that would really be cruelty to humanity, knowing that the mother is in danger, that there's other people depending on the mother that are already, you know, a a husband, a son. And then out of whatever to bring a full uh, baby like in that situation to full term, and then they would suffocate to death within 30 days, if the baby got that far, yeah. that's cruelty to humanity. That is not pro-life. That's not, that's not life. That is not yes. life. Um, so, you know, although my, this is my editorialization right here, I don't think anybody likes abortion. And I think when you hear people on TV certain politicians, the people that believe in them, um, they act like that women, whether it was the women from the days prior to Roe v. Wade up until now, they act like 
women like this choice and that yeah. people take it lightly and that abortion is a light thing. It is not. It is a very heavy medical procedure. And for folks that I have personally known that had to make that choice, it is um, it, it risks them not to be able to have children later on. So when they're among their other friends who have children, you know, a lot of times you know, they, they are going through some mental challenges about the fact that, well, if I hadn't have done that earlier, then I might have would have had, you know. So, I mean, there's a lot to this. There's a lot yeah. to this. And uh, true, I, I agree. Life, I love life. I want life. That's not something anybody wants to do. Um, but what I don't like is that I have, let's just take me personally, I have two children that I love. They're grown men. I love them. I love them like as if they were still three years old. But, you know, I am pro-choice, but don't make it sound like I love murder. Yeah. I, don't, I, I, I don't want abortion per se for anybody, but in your situation, that is, you know, that was a more of a pro-life choice actually to do that. Uh, as opposed to not. It was the only option. You know, the the term choice gets used like it's the choice of a pair of shoes, but yeah. it's not. It's the only option to save my life and to end hope suffering. Yeah. Um, and yes. make sure that I was there for my son and my, my husband. Yes, most definitely. Now, let's go into some of the technical um, facets of abortion. You're, you live, when you had the abortion, what state were you living in? Kansas. Kansas. And what's Kansas's rules, laws on abortion? Currently, the laws on abortion is there's a cutoff at 20 weeks. Um, and that was that was good for the time that I had the abortion because we found out at 17 weeks. But, you know, unfortunately, you know, I would have had liked to have spent a little bit more time, you know, just to be able to say goodbye in a way with, with hope. Um, but the law was not on our side for that piece. It had to be by 20 weeks. So at 18 weeks, we, we had the abortion. Okay. So that's that's one of the laws that surrounds it. An, another law that's surrounding the clinics that are in Kansas is they have to repeatedly ask you if you, the day of the abortion, if you want to have the abortion. And for me, they asked six times Ugh. if I wanted to be there, if I wanted to have the abortion. And the deep, deep parts of my heart, did I want to be there doing that? Absolutely not. No. But the thing is that I knew that it was the right option for me and for the baby that I was carrying to have the abortion. So it, it made it traumatizing. It made it agonizing. In addition to that, um, for the final stage of the procedure, because for me, it was called a dilation and evacuation, a D and E. Mm -hmm. uh, D and C is something different for an earlier stage pregnancy mm -hmm. uh, that people hear about more often, as well as the abortion pill. But mm -hmm. for me, it was a D and E because of my stage of pregnancy. And it's an all day affair. Um, it starts out at seven o'clock in the morning when you get to the, the clinic. Um, you know, going through another ultrasound and then to see a baby's body that I already know knew was broken and, you know, broken up and, and things like that. Um, being asked several times if I wanted to be there, if I wanted to have the abortion and then going through with the first stage of it. And then you have to wait for four hours for your body to kick in and start the labor process. Oh. And yeah. And then after that, where they get to, 
to the part where they actually separate you from um, the the baby, they actually give you something called midazolam because okay. you're not in a because you're not in a hospital. They can't fully anesthetize you for the surgery. Oh. So they so they give you midazolam, and it's supposed to make you sleepy. Mm-hmm. And it's supposed to help you forget the procedure. But the problem is that every time I fell asleep, I would stop breathing. Uh. And, and so they had to keep waking me up. So I remember the whole procedure and everything mm-hmm. that happened to, to Hope. And, you know, part of that is the fact that because of the laws that are in place, you mm-hmm. can't have abortions in hospitals. They have to be in these separated clinics because of funding. Okay. If people have, you know, abortion services available, they lose funding as a hospital. And that's something that we've put in place um, in our in our government. Um, okay. The other piece of it was that during the last part of the procedure, my husband was not allowed in the room with me as a support system. Oh. So, you know, I had very loving care providers, the doctor, the nurses, you know, they were as kind to me as they could be. One of the nurses held my hands and kept eye contact mm-hmm. with mm-hmm. me for the as much of the procedure as she could because mm-hmm. she was also monitoring my vitals at the right. same time. Right. Um, but it wasn't the same as having my own husband there to right. support me. Right, right. So right. some of these laws that we've wrapped around clinics are making it very cruel for yeah. the mother that's going through the procedure. Yes. And then, you know, in addition, since, you know, we've started, or we, not, we haven't started, but since the war with Ukraine and Russia have started, mm-hmm. there are several states that have overturned laws um, supporting reproductive health care. Yes. So, um, you know, we've, Texas kind of started the ball rolling with their six week heart week, heartbeat bill. Uh-huh. Um, meaning that after six weeks of pregnancy, you cannot have an abortion. They've also made it so that there's a $10,000 bounty on the head of yes. women who go yeah. have an abortion anyway. Yeah. And there's several states that are tra- that are copycatting that. And since we've we're paying attention to this war over here, these mm-hmm. states are overturning it like crazy. Yeah. And especially going into the summer, there you know even in Kansas where I had my abortion, they're trying to take abortion out of the constitution and amend it in Kansas. Um, Missouri is criminalizing abortion. Yeah. Is trying to. Um, there's just all sorts of, you know, Idaho is trying to copy the heartbeat bill as well. Mm-hmm. Um, so is Ohio and mm-hmm. several other states. So it's just, mm-hmm. it's, it's turned into this crazy war on reproductive rights. And mm-hmm. it's really sad. It is very sad uh, when you think about abortion in the case of yours in the case of rape and in the case of um, incest um, for these these laws. Now, let me go back a little bit and I hope I can remember all that I want to say to you. Yeah. So with the, the so going back for the audience, you're at 17 weeks. You're told this information. Your mind is prepped at this appointment to hear boy or girl, twins, triplets. Then all of a sudden collapse. You're told about this brutal disease on your baby. The next week, you have to have this procedure. This is a one week mind process. And so that's for something this drastic and serious. That's a short period of time to come to that conclusion. Yes. When you come to that conclusion, uh, because because the state law, you had to hurry up and make such a drastic uh, 
decision in your life because the state law says after 20 weeks. So you had to hurry up. That affects one's mental health to have to hurry up and make such an important and critical decision about one's own life and the life of another person and the life of your whole family. Okay, so yes. people don't know or see that these state laws are going to affect someone's mental health, for one. Then, correct me if I'm wrong, with them taking out clinics and people eliminating clinics and states, don't women have to drive, in some cases, great distances to get an abortion? Uh, if you know, there's, I think there's, I heard one time that there's one clinic. Is it one clinic in, in Kansas? Was that the there's, clinic? there's two, there's only one that offers the procedure that I had. Mm -hmm. Um, but there, yeah, there's two clinics in Kansas. So, right. yeah, so I mean, for uh, an entire state now, no, no, there shouldn't be, I'm not saying I'm editorial terrorizing right here. You know, it's not necessary to be any and everywhere, but I'm just saying that's another cruelty to a person who's in a situation such as yourself, ancestor rape to have to drive possibly hours and hours to go get this procedure. Then once you get to the procedure, someone's asking you, as you said in your case, six times, do you really want to have this procedure? Do you really want to have this procedure? Um, you know, and so this is all, I would think, affecting your mental health, you know, um, and then you're given some kind of drug, and I've never heard the, of this, the mezepan that makes you forget? Midazolam. Midazolam, excuse me. Yeah, yeah. It makes yeah. you supposedly close. forget? Yeah. You know, I mean, you know, I, I, you know, I have a problem with all of, all of this, you know? Um, yeah. So you've told us about the, the, the decision you all had to make and the actual abortion process. On our pre-call, you told me about a woman named Anna. Yes. Can you share that information for my audience about Anna? Absolutely. So Anna is a woman from Texas mm -hmm. who at 17 weeks or 18 weeks, I can't remember exactly now, but at that time, around the same time I you know, found out about um, our daughter's condition, mm -hmm. her water broke. Okay. And they did a scan and found out that the baby was abnormally and underdeveloped okay. and that the baby was dying. Ugh. And she needed the procedure that I had, right. the DNE. But right. because she was in the state of Texas, she okay. had to, she couldn't have the procedure that I had. And she had to wait and hope that her body recognized that the pregnancy had ended okay. and hope that her body miscarried and hope that she didn't get an infection that possibly killed her. Uh. And, you know, it's, it's serious enough that I actually did a women's uh, history day uh, or national interday national day of women um with a woman who from Egypt whose body mm -hmm. carried her passed away pregnancy for up to six mm -hmm. months and she got septic from oh. the past pregnancy and that almost killed her almost took away oh. her life and it was oh. the same thing for Anna it could have taken away her life luckily yeah. she's still alive today okay. but there's a very real serious health threat yes. to needing this procedure and not being able to have it. Right. Oh my goodness. I just, so, so what is your opinion, Kelsey? Of course, on such a divisive subject as abortion, you know, and people, you know, there's going to be people that say, you know, pro-life. There's going to be people that say pro-choice. But why do you really think this 
certain weeks are in place, the threat to reproductive health. Do you think this is a systemic problem uh, because we are in a patriarchal society and the rights of women it refuses to be heard? What do you think about the women that also defeat other women and the rights to be heard? What do you think all of this is really coming from? I think that a lot of it does come from this kind of patriarchal society and our, even as women, the roles we play in the patriarchal mm -hmm. society. Because mm -hmm. yeah. really the narrative that's surrounding abortion right now is this thought of loose women who are going out and partying and getting pregnant. Well, who's writing that narrative? Because right. it's, it's not me. It's definitely yeah. not me. And yeah. it's definitely not women who are having to have these procedures either. It's right. definitely people who are out there trying to dominate the health of others. And overwhelmingly, that's, you know, a government that is white and a government that is predominantly male. Yes. Yes, most definitely. Most definitely. And, you know, Madeline Albright, who passed away recently, um, I saw where she was contributed as to have said there's a special place in hell for women that don't support other women. Now, that's kind of a loosely based, but uh, she's credited yeah. with something like that. And it's I find it kind of unusual, you know, that women, all women don't band together to say, uh, we're not advocating murder. We're not advocating killing kids. You know, all of us have a chance to be mothers. So why in the world would we do that? But in these cases where it's a medical necessity, incest or rape, you know, and, you know, there has to be these circumstances that this mother may have to get this procedure because it actually is a pro-life choice to keep the mother alive and to keep the other family members that are depending on her possibly, you know, to keep that whole, that's a whole humanity type of thing. If your life is threatened, if you have been brutally raped, which that's a whole other pathway of mental health and all of these things. So, you know, I just find it very strange that women don't band together uh, for other other women. But, you know, I just have never <laughs> understood that. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's something very hard to wrap the head around. Um, you know, it's, it's like we've got this all or nothing narrative yeah. in society. And it's just, it's so old and so... Yes. written by people who don't need to be writing it and right. Um, right. you know that's what that's why I wrote my book is mm -hmm. when everything was going down in Texas and Mississippi I was like I have to get this out of me and it has to yeah. be somebody has to hear it yes 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 most definitely so now tell me um so let's go into this and the reasoning of why you wrote the book. And we're going to get into some other processes, one more process, and then talk about uh, how you have moved forward. Um, how did this, this is part of my mental health series. This interview uh, is one of the parts of my mental health series. And I will repeat uh, that people will hear over and over again in all of these podcasts and videos is the fact that due to the pandemic, due to very high profile young people taking their lives uh, the past couple of years where Kate Spade and Anthony Bourdain, people who were seem to have everything going for themselves. I even know personally of a person, the, a neighbor of one of my siblings took his life. Um, you know, mental health, our mental health is very fragile in the society and the pandemic did even more so to that. A lot of people celebrate 
uh, self-care, but a lot of people are still locked up and don't know how to take care of themselves. How did this situation affect the mental health of you, your family, and what did you do to move forward? Absolutely. Uh, so it was incredibly hard because of the small traumas and the big trauma of having the, the procedure. I, I developed post-traumatic stress disorder oh. and, and it included the flashbacks that you, you hear about, you know, people from the military having mm -hmm. it included mm -hmm. flashbacks of the procedure and I was struggling mental health wise um, mm -hmm. to take care of myself as well as yeah. my family. Yes. And during all of this, I was trying to find closure around Hope's death um, because we got back just a tiny little bag of ashes from her. Mm. Um, and that's what we had in memoriam of her. Mm -hmm. And so I reached out to seven different churches to yeah. try to have her ashes bless yeah. and and have a service for her because I worked for a nonprofit. My husband worked for the school district. We didn't have a whole lot of money to go to a funeral home to have services. Right. And all seven churches said no. And it was just, it was cruel. And then when I tried to reach out to a, um, what I thought was an abortion support group, oh. it was a pro-life organization that um, took me to a church where they told me that, you know, we might pray, pray for your baby, but you're going to go to hell. Oh and, my goodness. Yeah. And it was, it was awful. Um, <sighs> it took me a couple months after that to be able to reach out to try to find help again because I was so scared. Uh -huh, uh -huh. And so I just sat in our basement living room, just suffering with these post-traumatic flashbacks, uh -huh. this deep, dark depression surrounding the loss of hope and just struggling. And my husband finally, you know, was like, we can't, you can't keep going like this and right. found a psychologist that would take us at a cheaper rate uh -huh. um, since uh -huh. we were, you know, struggling financially after all of those medical bills came in. Right. right, right. Um, because even though she died, you know, the hospitals still want their money. Um, yeah. So it was a, a hard thing, but after I got hooked up with the psychologist, things started to get better. They, uh -huh. they had me get on medications for post-traumatic stress. They finally diagnosed me. And so I started climbing out of that dark hole and they started seeing a little bit more of the mom that I was, you know, before yes. the procedure happened. And, you know, it took me a couple years to then get hooked up with a psychologist that did EMDR therapy, right. which is a special kind of um, therapy with rapid eye movement to help okay. desensitize um, the flashbacks. Okay. Yeah. And so between that and um, writing the book down, it really started to unravel the trauma and make it less of a hor horrible weight to carry. Yes. Yes. And my big advice to, to people out there is to make sure that they, um, you know, reach out early and, and mm -hmm. don't wait and make sure that if you have, you know, a support partner already, have them help you advocate for yourself. Yeah. Or, you know, have, even if you don't ask for it, um, you know, be in tuned enough that you can, you can have those calls be made for you, even if you can't make them yourself. Yes, 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 yes. So 
it sounds like you have a great support system in your husband that that's wonderful. A lot of people, you know, don't have that. Um, but that is wonderful. And so you have another child, correct? Correct. So, um, in 2018, December of 2018, we welcomed our daughter Ember, um, to our family and she was a surprise. She beat birth control and <laughs> um, it was hard it was very hard to carry her because yeah. i you know kept wondering is you know she going to have the same disease hope had right. is, is it going to be something worse you know i felt like a ticking time bomb um until the genetic test came back that she was negative for the disease that hope had right 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 and right. I, and we had the the biggest sigh of relief we had yeah. like a small party for ourselves when we oh, found cool. out that she was gonna be okay but it was still very triggering to carry her yes and also yeah. very very hard grief wise because yes. you know every milestone that ember has hit you quietly think of you know this was the milestone that hope was supposed to hit yeah or, you know, she would have been five this year. Oh, wow. Wow. Yeah. So mm -hmm. it's, it's hard to, you know, not celebrate, but have that small honoring, you know, in the back of your head about, mm -hmm. um, about hope. Yes. Yes. Well, bless you because that's certainly, you certainly are for life. I don't want to yeah. use that other term before somebody you know gets mad at me, but you're definitely for life. You know, you're, yeah. you're, you're yes. a loving mother. You're a loving mother. You apparently are a loving wife, and you have a loving husband. And so you're you're for you're definitely for life. You know. Yeah. Uh, so, wow, I really really love that. Now, um, another thing you did, you moved on. Um, you've got a great little website here called From the Green Desk because you told me before you have a literal green desk. But tell yes. us about your um, profit and tell us how you're helping others. Absolutely. So I'm um, forming a nonprofit called From the Green Desk, like you said. Um, it is is a coaching as well as group therapy program for women who have had abortions, lost children, or lost pregnancies so mm -hmm. that they can be guided by someone who's been there personally mm -hmm. uh, and work through those issues. We also are going to start um, at the end of April uh, a program called Narrative Meditation. Oh. Um, Will find their words and find yes. the way to express what yes. they've been through. Yes. Um, and then in addition to that, um, because I, I haven't said and enough, uh, <laughs> we uh, do a weekly blog as well as in April, we'll be coming out with a podcast as well. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Fantastic. Fantastic. Uh, I, I just love that. And you know, you heard me tell you in a pre-call about the story of my own mother uh, who had a miscarriage. And when she was telling me this as I was in my pre-teens or teens, you know, she would often look in the distance. You could tell that my mother still had not gotten over that miscarry, you know. Mm -hmm. So this would have been something uh, for her to go to. Uh, you know, and maybe, you know, get that sense of I'm not alone and all by myself. And I can talk to this woman about my experience uh, since the church, at least in your area, doesn't seem to support anyone. Um, yeah. And that's one little thing I want to go back to right quick. I can't believe seven churches refused to bless your child's ashes. That was just to me, those churches don't even need to be open. <laughs> they yeah. need to close. They need to close. That's certainly not the from the, my Christianity perspective. Certainly not of Jesus. Jesus 
you know, was around all kinds of people and he blessed and healed all kinds of people and loved all kinds of people. I just feel like those churches need to close immediately <laughs> because yeah. they're, not doing their, they're not doing their job. Yeah, and if it, you are willing to understand where you were coming from medically, that's horrible. Yeah, and it's a it's a level of cruelty, and it also you know it speaks to their humanity yes. or lack of, and not mine for sure. Yes, definitely a lack of humanity at those churches, definitely. And um, tell us a little bit about the fifty state challenge. Yeah. So the 50 state challenge is something that's kind of a personal, um, but also a community, um, you know, fist in the air. We're not going to take it anymore kind of initiative. Mm -hmm. um, I am printing my books at cost and sending them to both state senators, governors, Supreme Court justices, and the president to give them a physical narrative for them yeah. to read about what abortion is and right. what the laws that they're putting in place are causing harm and how and like who the people are that need this procedure as health care right yes yeah so the so the 50 states challenge is a reach out to people to be able to donate to sponsor states. Um, you know, it's thirty dollars to sponsor a state. That's the the cost of printing three books and okay. mailing them um, out to the states. And I just feel that it's so important to rewrite this narrative that our systems have put in place surrounding abortion so that people mm -hmm. understand who they're who they're doing this to not yeah. just some statistic that they're used to wrapping a law again around. Exactly. Exactly. I agree. 100%, 100%. Well, I will say to you, Kelsey, thank you so much. Thank you so, so much because it still must be very challenging, if not difficult to share this story. But I think like you were talking about some of the therapy you'll be given the narrative therapy this is part of your healing and i just so appreciate you being able to write this story and for us to be able to share your story i really appreciate you and i think our audience my audience will get a lot out of this information absolutely well thank you so much for having me to to talk about it Yes, yes, no problem. I, I, I wanted you here and I'm glad to have had you here. Thank you so much. Thank you. So we'll have all of Kelsey's information down below in the show notes if you're listening to this podcast or down below the YouTube video. Um, we'll have all her links and social media handles and how to access her book. We'll have information on the 50 States challenges. Uh, so there you go. You'll be able to access everything and everything will be time stamped as usual, because we know everyone's time is short uh, and that you might not always have time to listen to the full episode, at least at first, but you'll be able to go to the different, very important parts of this interview. Once again, this interview is about mental health and the challenges that we endure. And this happens to be around the subject of abortion, which we all know is a very divisive situation um, in our society. So I hope you were able to get something out of it. Uh, I'm sure you will. And just stay tuned to the Bookaholic podcast. I appreciate you listening. Thank you for joining the Bookaholic Podcast. We appreciate your support. Remember to subscribe to the podcast. Follow us on Instagram at True Bookaholic. You can also email us at readingjunkie at book-a-holic.com. Don't forget to support your local library and independent bookstores.